There was some worry about the wind, which gave a clue that perhaps not all would remain under control. Like the dust, it set teeth on edge and jingle jangled nerve ends. The first whisper of what was to come arose shortly before noon, when a fire was reported just south of the city. Others came quickly from the north, in the Adelaide Hills, in the southeast, and on the other side of the mountains. Within two hours, major fires were burning on six fronts. The early afternoon was besieged with the wailing of alarms and the smell of smoke and panic. It was the wind that did it, turning small fires into big ones, blowing them forward at 50 kilometers an hour and more. Chaos spread as quickly as the fires. Citizens with places in the hills were told to go home, but then later, they were ordered to keep away. Children had been sent home early from school because it had been so hot. The strong winds kept the fires coming, racing them up the gullies. In the Adelaide Hills, it was three years ago all over again. Only now, it would be many times worse. People who'd been missed by the last Ash Wednesday fires would not have the same good fortune this time. Fires moved at such speed that the thousands of volunteer firefighters now in action didn't know which way to turn next. The fires raced right up to the top of Mount Lofty, where the city's television towers were. The fires stripped down the scale of everything, having no respect for history nor for wealth. Treasured old mansions went up, along with new places. Brick or wood made little difference. As confusion ran with the fires, the air over Adelaide was choked even more, and visibility became so bad that traffic stopped. The power went off in many places. People trying to get away to their homes were trapped in city lifts. Telephones died away, and rumors came to life, and people despaired for news of each other. The residents of the Anglican monastery at Mount Lofty crouched on the floor and prayed as it was caught by the flames. Yeah, we could, um, the fires trapped many people. Unit, Some got away. And he backed up. We couldn't move, and then he backed into us and wrecked our truck. But we did. We saved the house that we were sending to stop anyway. How so, fast was the fire moving then? Oh, crap, we don't know. It just goes on us. Here's our captain. He'll tell you more about it. So I may have had the fire gone past us. Um, we couldn't move, so another truck had backed into us and turned the radiator in. The fire went over the top was the first time. We thought we were pretty right, but the wind suddenly sprung up and uh, this was like a fireball went right over the top of us and it just, it cooked us. But 13 died in the southeast and another 12 in the Adelaide Hills. They died in their houses, in streets and in cars. Adelaide radio journalist Murray Nickel from 5GN got both the scoop and the shock of his life. At the moment, I'm watching my house burn down. I'm sitting out on the road in front of my own house where I've lived for 13 or 14 years. Uh, it's going down in front of me. The roof is falling and it's in flames and there's nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing. There's been a fire here from summer down pumping water till we ran out and, and the flames are in the roof. And, and oh, God damn it, it's just beyond belief. It's my own house. And uh, everything around is black. There are fires burning all around me, all around me. His broadcast tremored round the world. Later, people in other countries would imagine that half of Australia was in flames and international telephone cables were jammed. Almost everything that moved was thrown in to try to stop the flames. Farmers did what they could to save their stock. But there was much suffering among the animals. Then, at four o'clock, the wind changed, taking the fronts of the fires to even greater distances, and the smoke flooded everywhere. In the southeast, the little town of Kalangadu came under fierce attack. There were then a dozen major fires around Adelaide, and in the mid-north and the southeast. Firemen were told, save only lives and property, each unit for himself. People were dying terribly. <laughs> just phenomenal, just phenomenal. I just, 
boom, everything went. It's just incredible. Nobody can help anybody. You just know why you can. People assist anybody. Don't feel like it. So. Brave firemen were burned too. Those who got away were branded with the sights they'd seen. Well, there was a little news in the hose on the back of the truck. Um, had the strip hose stretched to full legs. And when I turned around, the flames came up over the top of the hill that quick. I didn't have a chance to get back to the truck. The flames pushed me back. I had to turn around and run the other way. Burned arms, on my back and my face. I sort of hid behind a snowy pole to stop myself getting burned any further until it cleared up a bit. I couldn't see anything with the smoke and the wind. I just managed to see the lights of the truck come back. I jumped on that, then they picked me up, took me to the ambulance, and I ended up down here. Its previous good fortune deserted Greenville in the hills, one of Adelaide's most affluent suburbs, where several people were killed. The wind picked up the embers and flung them through the foothills, making one run after another. And so it went on into the afternoon. How much stuff have you got? The right refugees the took what they could. It was a time to think of priorities, with oh, life the first. But what possessions us. were the most important? Um, Religious people to tried to keep close to God. How I bought my Bible, because that's the biggest gift of all. <laughs> Others carried with them only their fear. There was a lot of touching as people looked to succor one another. The fire tore away the normal social reserve and strangers hugged each other. By late afternoon, it was all fire. In the southeast, it came in from the west like an avenging host, now burning on a front of 120 kilometers. It swooped across the border into Victoria, sweeping everything in front of it, along with hopes of stopping. The hounds of hell were in full flight. By early afternoon in southern Victoria, it was well over 40 degrees when the first fires broke out. As in South Australia, no one had any idea of what was ahead. An early outbreak arose at Fiends Marsh, a small dairying place inland from the Great Ocean Road. The fire sprang in two directions, towards the coast and eastwards. One tore through the thick Otway Ranges, striking at the seaside town of Lorne, where it burned at the northern end. People further along the Great Ocean Road saw the smoke in the distance, but hardly dreamed that they too would soon be part of it. Another fire started in East Trentham, north of Melbourne, neighboring the grand old Macedon district, much of which would later be destroyed. The fire came south, first of all, through the Wombat State Forest. Once a haven, it would be no sanctuary this day for humankind, nor beast, nor bird. Further along the coast in the southwest, late in the afternoon, around Warrnambool, 100,000 hectares of rich dairy country would be lost, and thousands of people evacuated. A third fire took off in the Dandenong Mountains to the east of Melbourne. In terms of loss of human life, this would be the worst of them, wiping out whole towns before it was done. Firemen along the Great Ocean Road waited by the sea, ready to move. Those who went in were soon driven back by the speed and heat of it, getting out with their lives and knowing that it was going to get worse. But even then, they didn't comprehend its force. Townspeople back along the road were still innocent. Even when the power went off, they wondered if it had been caused by a traffic accident. Some sat on their porches and sipped cool drinks and speculated. Men with horses in paddocks near the fire raced down the road through the police blocks to get them out. They brought them on foot all the way back. The neighbor camp, some stock was saved you know, and some was not. Was, you know, it's fire here. I said, my God, fire will come out, you know. The stock is on the corner in that, that paddock, a rugged paddock, you know, and the forestry next to it, but we get close, just couldn't get any, any closer. Early in the evening along the Great Ocean Road, the wind switched round to the southwest. It probably saved the rest of the lawn, which had been cut off when a bridge on the road had burned through. It sent the fire off and running back along the coast at enormous speed, covering 10 kilometers in eight minutes. It headed towards Aries Inlet and Anglesey, devouring huge sections of forest. The fire in the Dandenongs spread south and east, tearing through the bush and houses with equal rapacity. The hills were heaving with their plight. Trees groaned, 
wind moaned, bush burst asunder, and children cried out. From a long distance off in the air, the fire could be seen lurking beneath the dense foliage, like a kind of creeping lava. in all directions in the Dandenongs, trying to match the fickle ways of the fires, now generating their own winds. As they fought for some, their own homes elsewhere were lost. But they pitched in together. The only way to see the extent of the outbreak sweeping through Victoria was to fix the locations on a board at the Country Fire Authority headquarters, the centre of operations. But the picture kept changing so much. Tracking the fires became a deadly game of hide-and-seek as the fronts spotted ahead, sending out clumps of blazing bush that went forward like the wind, landed and started outbreaks afresh. People kept going, saving what they could, their lives first, then anything else. Keepers rounded up their animals, which were floundering over the countryside. At least, some of them had people to guide them. On the early evening of this dreadful day, late in summer, none of the usual bush sounds could be heard, none of the bird calls and the rustling of animals. Those that were left were fleeing for their lives. In place of that sweetness was the alarm of fire engines, the shuddering of helicopters, the war whoops of police cars and ambulances, the panic of people. Above, the smoke reached up past the clouds, swelling and bloating the evening sky staining it with the mark of events down below. With it came the tremors of the people and the stench of fear among the gas of the gum trees that last summer had been so fragrant. Some of the sky itself was the color of burning. What breath was left below was being stripped of life, sucked at by the fires. The light was pallid and the sun went away well ahead of its time, leaving the country already spent.